Malcolm X was born 98 years ago today, in Omaha, Nebraska, on May 19, 1925. Malcolm was assassinated just 39 years later, on February 21, 1965, when he was standing at the podium before a crowd in Harlem's Audubon Ballroom. His wife, Betty Shabazz, pregnant with twins, and his four daughters, aged 6, 4, 2, and 5 months, were in the ballroom, looking on. In February, the family of Malcolm X filed a $100 million wrongful death lawsuit against the FBI, the CIA, New York City and State, and the NYPD and the district attorney's office for concealing evidence of their involvement in Malcolm X's 1965 assassination. This is not a Baruka. We want to present to you a wholesome kind of level of consciousness right now. So subscribe and tell your friend them. This is Muta Baruka. Well, today we spend the hour remembering Malcolm X. We begin with Angela Davis. She said the following in Malcolm's eulogy. Last year, from Africa, he wrote these words, Malcolm wrote these words to a friend. My journey, he says, is almost ended. And I have a much broader scope than when I started out which I believe will add new life and dimension to our struggle for freedom and honor and dignity in the States. I am writing these things so that you will know for a fact the tremendous sympathy and support we have among the African States for our human rights struggle. The main thing he wrote is that we keep a united front wherein our most valuable time and energy will not be wasted fighting each other. Okay. Malcolm's words and his trajectory as a movement leader and a movement participant are as valuable today as they were six decades ago. They resonate in powerful ways because the change Malcolm was calling for, the change we were calling for, has not yet happened. And therefore, Malcolm's vision cannot be relegated to the past. His vision still helps us to imagine the future we want to see. Now, official United States narratives of past history always attempt to assimilate demands for radical transformation into a neat story of progress and triumph. The very fact that black freedom struggles came to be compressed and constricted by the rubric Civil Rights Movement. I mean, of course, the Civil Rights Movement was important, but that was not the entire story of the Black Freedom Movement. And that in itself is indicative of this assimilationist uh, tendency. Uh, the fact that we ourselves often refer to the movement for black freedom as only a civil rights movement. During the 1960s, Malcolm emphasized the need to expand our vision. He told us that it was not only about civil rights, the rights that can be accorded to individuals by a single nation, state, and its government. Our vision needed to be broader. It had to move, Malcolm said, across the borders of nation states. It had to be transnational, it had to be international. The framework that Malcolm urged us to use was human rights. Now, Malcolm's trajectory and his insistence on radical frameworks has never been easily assimilable into a narrative of U.S. history as one in which increasing numbers of people get to participate in the circle of justice, equality, and freedom. Um, and 
I'm thinking about the way in which uh, uh, Dr. King's uh, uh, image has been entirely assimilated uh, into a capitalist narrative, uh, um, which is not to say that Dr. King represented uh, those ideas, but this is the, the official narrative, the official representation. Now, Malcolm's vision from the very outset, or at least from uh, the, the, the time he uh, uh, made the pilgrimage uh, to Mecca, was, was an international vision, including not only people in the US and not only black people, but people all over the world. And I tell you that I treasure the story that was told to me by Yuri Kochiyama about hosting a meeting in her Harlem apartment where Malcolm met with survivors of uh, the bombing, the, the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. And there's also a photograph of Yuri leaning over Malcolm's body in this place, shortly after he was assassinated. Uh, and I often wonder, why, why is it that that photograph is not circulated uh, more widely? You know, why didn't we see Yuri represented in Spike's film? Uh, <laughs> This is a time when we can reflect on uh, what, what we should call the long struggle for freedom. The long struggle for freedom conducted by and on behalf of black people in the Americas. The struggle against slavery, the struggle against segregation and secondhand uh, citizenship, and of course the struggle of Africans against the slave trade and colonialism and neo-colonialism. This is a time to reflect deeply on the long struggle for liberation that has already spanned multiple centuries. It is also a time to reflect on how we might accelerate that struggle in order to guarantee that those who have been denied entrance into the circle of freedom might not only be admitted, but by recognizing their struggles, their collective multi-generational vision, it might be possible to imagine future worlds. And Malcolm asked us to keep our eyes on the future. Future worlds, radical, democratic futures for all beings who inhabit this planet. And so, in, in the spirit of, of Malcolm's contributions, I want us to ponder a couple of questions. Uh, how has it actually been possible for black people and our allies, including in the first place indigenous people, how has it been possible to remain committed over so many centuries, over so many generations to this struggle for freedom? That is phenomenal. That each generation has passed on that impulse to fight for freedom to the next. And oftentimes, even when we thought the flames had been extinguished, um, we have um, a Black Lives Matter movement erupting. Uh, and, and so uh, I think that, um, that we should um, acknowledge the uh, phenomenal uh, quality of black culture, uh, black political culture, uh, black music, uh, because where have we learned to cultivate that impulse for freedom? 
I mean, that is, that is the reason why we observe black history. You know, black history is not uh, just uh, because there are black people in you know, various parts of <laughs> the world. It's about what black people have offered to people all over the world. And that is the desire, the cultivation of the desire to keep on struggling for freedom. <laughs> it is in the art. It is the very heart of the music. And that is why black music is known by people all over this planet. Now, there's also the question, um, which we have to acknowledge. Why is it um, that uh, racism has persisted for so long? Um, and why has it become so naturalized that its proponents often believe that what we refer to as racism is the natural destiny of the world? Now, Malcolm understood the deeply ideological character of racism. And I use the term ideology to mean the way that we humans imagine ourselves in relation to the conditions of our existence. Malcolm understood that ideology, even when you define it as the source of uh, illusory ideas about such, con about such conditions, that ideology's role is precisely to make the conditions of our lives appear to be normal. And as a matter of fact, the more normal something appears to be, the more likely it is to be produced in and through ideology. This is the point that that abolitionists make about the seeming permanence of jails and prisons, about uh, the permanence of police, about the so-called school resource offices, about the child protective, so-called child protective services uh, that um, um, Dorothy Roberts calls the family policing system. But thanks uh, to the way in which Malcolm taught us uh, to engage in the kind of radical reflection on that which is ideological, uh, we, we know that we can envision life beyond prisons and police. We can envision life beyond capitalism. Now, Malcolm used his remarkable oratory and his phenomenal sense of humor to trouble our sense of comfort in a world that was predicated, that is predicated, remains predicated on white superiority. Malcolm helped us to understand how we internalize those ideological assumptions and how their persistence depends on all of us doing the work of prisons, the work of the police, the work of capitalism, white supremacy. Uh, now, I had the opportunity to hear Malcolm in person. <laughs> and as, as a matter of fact, one of the, thing I'm, one of the things I'm most proud about uh, uh, connected to my time in college was the fact that Malcolm came in April of 1963 to speak at Brandeis University. And because there was only a handful of black students there, I got to meet him. <laughs> I was all of the black students got to meet him and to spend time with him. <laughs> But that's another story. <laughs> um, you know, I wanted to, to point out that there are, there are um, um, signs, there is evidence that we can challenge uh, that which is ideologically imposed. 
and, and, and I'm thinking about um, one area um, that we've seen a lot of change in over a relatively short period of time. And that is the demystification of the gender binary. Yes. I mean, who would have ever thought 20 years ago that we would be acknowledging again the ideological character of gender? Uh, uh, that, we, that we would be attentive to pronouns. Now, who would have ever imagined that? Uh, and I think it's important to recognize it, not only in terms of the advances that the trans movement um, has made, but also is evidence that we can dismantle other institutions whose seeming permanence uh, is also a product of ideology. As we develop the capacity to think about the damage wrought by racism, we often take shortcuts and we capitulate to heteropatriarchal assumptions that the targets of racism are primarily black men, or ethnocentric assumptions that racism affects exclusively black people. Ron DeSantis, uh, and Ben, thank you <laughs> for uh, asking us to uh, reflect on what is going on uh, uh, with that. Uh, don't let me characterize him. Uh, uh, Go on. But, but, but I just heard him. Uh, the, well, okay, I'll tell you that I just heard him, I think it was yesterday, uh, or maybe it was the day before, uh, uh, he, making fun of the fact that queer theory was included um, under the rubric of the Black Studies Advanced Placement course that you were talking about. Uh, and, uh, you know, He's pretty stupid. <laughs> you, know, you know, one of the things you learn, one of the things you learn when you really try to engage in a serious process of learning, you learn that the more you learn, the less you know. <laughs> you know, you learn all, you learn there's always so much more to learn, and 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 and, and this um, government, this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so, but but you know the. the <laughs> And what has he said? I guess he, he also, they, they also removed uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, so you're not allowed to talk about intersectionality. But I was just going to say that we have to think about the intersectionality of racism. You know, it's not just about identities. Uh, um, and because this is a historical moment when we are called upon to comprehend the structural, the systemic, the institutional character of racism. And then, okay, I'm just gonna call them counter-revolutionaries, right? Uh, because it reminds me so much of, of, of the, the period of, of radical reconstruction and, and, and the responses to it. And following W.E.B. Du Bois, I'm just gonna call them the counter-revolutionaries uh, uh, because they are trying to prevent uh, 
the progressive uh, developments uh, uh, from, um, from transforming our lives. And all he can think about is wokeness. He, I mean, he doesn't even know what wokeness means. Uh, <laughs> but he, he, he thinks that, that uh, black studies will cause white children to feel bad about themselves. I think he must be talking about himself. Uh, uh, <laughs> In any event, the reason we are witnessing these uproars right now from DeSantis's strategies in Florida to the actions of the college board um, is that education is integrally related to social change. And this is something Malcolm taught us, uh, uh, both through his words and through his actions. Uh, you know, thanks to Malcolm's uh, decision to teach himself in prison, vast numbers of incarcerated people do the hard work of learning, often learning how to read, as Malcolm did, but certainly learning um, how to use their intellects. Uh, and as a matter of fact, there's probably um, uh, more intellectual greatness behind bars now than in any other place. We're on the verge of substantial shifts in the way people think about race and racism. And those who want to prevent these shifts from happening are frantically trying to turn back the clock. At least 36 states have adopted or introduced laws that impede educational projects about race and racism. And here in New York, at the end of 2021, Republican lawmakers introduced bills that prevent public schools from providing instruction on structural racism. Even in the most progressive states, uh, and you know, I come from California, and most of the times I'm I'm happy uh, to say that I come from, you know, California, um, uh, because, uh, uh, well, first of all, I live in Oakland, yeah. and you know, Oakland uh, celebrates May 19th. Oakland and Berkeley. Malcolm X's birthday is an official holiday in both of those cities. Uh, uh, but. Um, but even in the most progressive states, uh, that we see efforts to restrict and confine um, instruction. California is also, I think, the only state with a statewide ethnic studies curriculum. Yes. Uh, but there have been major efforts, vociferous efforts, to prevent the inclusion of Palestine and Palestinians and Palestinian Americans in the curriculum. Amidst all of the pain and suffering produced by the COVID pandemic, and we're not that far removed from that era, this new collective awareness of the structural character of racism was generated. Not that it was a new way of thinking about racism. Scholars like W.E.B. Du Bois pointed this out scores of decades ago. Malcolm talked about institutional change, but the change, as many people have recognized uh, over the decades, is one that involves not so much a shift in subjective attitudes, although that's definitely welcome, um, but it's about structural transformation. It's not about white people not liking black people or indigenous people or, or Latinx people. Um, and that will change if there is structural change. But we can treat racism as a um, character defect or a character flaw and leave the entire 
systematic structure of racism intact. You know, they talk about racism without the races. So. But in the, in, 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 in the spirit of all of the freedom movements that um, I tried to evoke at the beginning of my um, presentation, all of the free, freedom movements that have preceded us, uh, let us vow never to forget the summer of 2020. It was only two and a half years ago. And we're already treating it like, yeah, like it's a, a, his, like it's, it's a relic of history. Uh, um, it was two and a half years ago when we were deep in the throes of the worst crisis most of us can remember, and we collectively experienced the police uh, lynching, the police murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and all of the others uh, that have been referred to. This occurred in the process of also recognizing that communities that were already subject to racism were the ones who were suffering most from the COVID pandemic. A new awareness of the structural racism within the healthcare system, within the privatized healthcare system, within the capitalist healthcare system. Actually, not so much a new awareness, but a collective attentiveness to an idea that activists, scholar activists have been insisting on since the era of radical reconstruction in the aftermath of slavery. And there have been those who have pointed out that racism is connected to capitalism, that capitalism is at its core racial capitalism and not only here in the US. Capitalism was produced by colonialism and slavery. But finally, it seemed, people seemed to get it. Racism does not emanate from the fact that white people don't like black people, or indigenous, or Latinx, or Asian people. It is produced and reproduced structurally, systemically, institutionally. And this was a kind of collective aha moment. And we should never forget that. This is why more people poured out into the streets of this country than ever before in the history. This is why people join the uh, mobilizations. This is why more white people joined all of the, the, the mobilizations. Uh, and People were out in the streets even though we did not yet know then how COVID was transmitted. Millions of people poured out into the streets at the risk of their own lives. Demonstrating this new awareness became more important than the lives of individuals. The most remarkable moment in our recent history, maybe even in the history of this country. And this is why DeSantis and others are excising examination of this movement from the school curriculum. And so the stage was set for us to attempt to accomplish what should have been done in the 19th century in the immediate aftermath of slavery. And it seemed that a good majority of people in this country, people of all racial and ethnic backgrounds, seemed to realize this. To overlay the political context, all of this was happening during the presidency of the person whose name shall not be pronounced during our meeting this evening. Thus, the counter-revolution. Thus, the attack against critical race theory, which is a serious interdisciplinary field founded on the work of those who were attempting many years ago to understand the way structural racism expressed itself through the law. So those of you who are interested in history will be utterly struck by all of the parallels between the reaction to radical reconstruction 
1867 to 1877 and what we are currently ex witnessing. The police murder of Tyree Nichols in the very same city in which Dr. King was assassinated punctuates the message that racism is structural. Awareness of racism is not about making white children feel guilty. It is about recognizing the deep structures of racism in all of our institutions, regardless of who the individual perpetrators might be. It is a machine, it is a system, it is a culture that is produced and reproduced. And now, we know better how to initiate the process of ridding our worlds of racism. We know better than ever before. And I just have a few more words. Um, I just I want to say it involves standing up against heteropatriarchy. Yeah. We know that it involves saying no to economic exploitation. We know we cannot exclude any community that suffers from the effects of racism. And this includes Asian Americans, and this includes Arab Americans, this includes Palestinians. We know, we know finally that we cannot struggle for human freedom without recognizing that we are all animals and that we must stand in support of our non-human co-inhabitants of this planet. Uh, and thank you so much uh, for the, the beautiful um, metaphor of the rabbit, um, the pattern of the rabbit escaping. But I think that uh, we look at, we look at um, simple creatures like ants that are able to entirely transform um, a place and build these edifices, these architectural edif edifices without at all harming the environment. I think we have much to learn from them that it is possible to benefit from this earth, even to transform it without annihilating the very conditions of future life on this planet. Thank you very much. Professor Angela Davis, speaking at the Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz Memorial and Educational Center, the site of the Audubon Ballroom in New York City, where Malcolm X was assassinated February 21st, 1965. Angela Davis was speaking on the 58th anniversary of his death this year. Malcolm was born 98 years ago today, May 19th, 1925. The informative information presented in this video is motivational and is positively aimed at inspiring, educating and entertaining the viewers with the cutting edge of critical reasoning. If you enjoy the contents on the Black Radar YouTube channel, please consider subscribing to show your support.